Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest State of .NET webinar, Azure Architecture. Today, Marcus Egger will provide guidance on Microsoft Azure services, how to use them, and most importantly, when to use them. He'll be demonstrating how to use some of the most useful Azure services in .NET. My name is Jim Duffy, and I'm the Director of Business Development here at Code. I was a developer and training instructor back in the day, and now I'm responsible for the marketing and sales effort for all of our code services, including Code Magazine, of course, but Code is so much more than just a magazine. Yes, Code Magazine is our flagship and probably how you know about us, but one of our other divisions includes Code Consulting, where we do custom software development projects. Our continuing mission is to help people build better software. We're a Microsoft partner and provide a number of services, including building custom software applications on-prem and in the cloud, modernizing legacy applications, educating developers, providing developer resources to augment your development team, and supporting and maintaining existing applications. Our team of expert developers and consultants are ready to help you with your project. One of the very popular free services we offer, we call our free hour of code. It provides an opportunity for you and your team to meet with our hand-picked experts to discuss anything you could use our help with. Slots are limited, so reach out to me today about getting your free hour of code scheduled for you and your team. No strings, no commitment, no credit card required, just free help from our code experts. Code Consulting is looking for React developers. Come join the Code Consulting team. We have multiple junior and senior React positions currently open. Full-time and contractor positions are available. Follow the link for more information. Looking for a new gig? Check out our jobs page for our open positions. Are you interested in writing for Code Magazine? Follow that link for more information. Are you looking to add team members to your development team? Our Code Staffing Division can help you find the development talent you're looking for. If you like what you see here today or have seen in our prior webinars, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Code Magazine is the leading software development magazine written by expert developers for developers. As a benefit for attending, all registered attendees who don't already subscribe will automatically receive a free digital subscription to Code Magazine. I've also included a free subscription link for you to share with others who couldn't make it to the webinar today. We would like your feedback about this webinar in the form of a quick survey, and we're willing to pay 100 bucks in the form of an Amazon e-card to one lucky attendee. A name will be drawn from the entire webinar's registered attendee list, and a completed survey is required to qualify for the e-card. If the selected name hasn't completed a survey, another name will be selected, and so on. No one wants to be that person whose name is selected only to lose out because you did out because you didn't complete the survey, right? The survey is very short, and you'll finish it in no time flat. The survey link is on the slide, and we'll post the survey link in the chat window as well. Just a quick shout out here about Fotino. Fotino is an open source project the code team is involved with that allows .NET developers to create native cross-platform desktop applications using web development technology. You can leverage your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript skills to create desktop applications that run on Windows, Linux, and the Mac. It's like Electron, only smaller and much more lightweight. Learn more at tryfotino.io. The slides and recording of today's webinar, and all our webinars, will be available on the stateof.net page on the code website. I've included that link here. Our presenter today is Marcus Egger. Marcus is the big shot around here. He's code president and chief software architect, publisher of Code Magazine, international author and speaker, Microsoft regional director, avid golfer, and all around nice guy. If this is your first time attending one of our webinars, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. If you've attended one of our webinars in the past, welcome back. Okay, you've heard enough from me. Thanks for listening. Take it away, Marcus. Well, thank you, Jim. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you might be at. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back after our summer break. Uh, it's been a little while since we've done the last one. We've skipped the month of August, so great to be back. Uh, let me switch over to my slide deck here. Uh, and I can see I'm already in need to fix my screen a little bit.
presentation uh, back home in the US after I did one from on the road um, at a location where the sun is rising right now. So our lighting conditions are going to change a little bit throughout this presentation, making this a little challenging. But anyway, uh, welcome to the presentation. We got a really interesting topic going today, one that's uh, near and dear to my heart, one that I felt was a little bit more specialized, that I felt was maybe not as much of a crowd pleaser. So I'm excited to see that we actually have a bigger turnout for this event than our last few events. So, so welcome everyone. I hope to, to make this worth your time. What are we talking about today? We're talking about Azure architecture. Uh, so in a lot of ways, we've talked about various Azure topics before, and you can go back and watch the Stata.net presentations on that. Um, and today, in a way, we're going over some of the same services, but we are taking a completely different angle. So we are looking at the services in Azure that you should be aware of, that you should probably be using in your app. But the main focus today is on architecting systems with those services and what should you use when. That is a question that I keep getting time and time again. Uh, we, we show these different Azure services and people and say, well, that's great, but I have this type of scenario and should I really use this service or should I use a different service and when do I use what? Uh, and there's a real skill to that. I think architecting systems uh, takes a lot of experience. Experience can really be beneficial. Experience can also work against you in a lot of ways. For those of us that have been around for more than the last five to seven years, and let's face it, most architects have been around for longer than that, um, we've gained a lot of experience in fixing certain problems and in a lot of ways, I often question whether we have those problems. And there's a certain skill that goes along with that that will help you pick and choose the types of things you do. And we'll see as I go through this presentation today that Azure has a lot of amazing offerings. And when you listen to what's just available out there in the wild, uh, you always get the impression you have to use them all and you have to use the largest and the greatest to be among the cool kids, so to speak. And the reality is you don't always need that. Uh, you don't always have the problems that those things solve. And so I'm hoping to shed a little bit of light on that. I'm hoping to share the experiences we have in our own development efforts and the efforts uh, that our customers and clients uh, put forth. Uh, I personally serve as a CTO for hire or advisor for uh, different companies. And so I want to share those experiences, but in the true spirit of Stata.net, I also want to share the experiences that we see uh, from people that are reading our magazine, from authors that are writing from us, uh, from the involvement we have with various insiders group, groups, whether that is ASP.NET insiders, whether that is Microsoft insider groups, whether that is regional director or MVP groups. So I'm trying to put all of that together and share those experiences with you and pass those on. Now, I always tell people, consider us a resource. I completely understand that in the time frame that we have allowed here to uh, allocate it here today, I can't address everything. Uh, so if you have any questions after this event, feel free to reach out to us. Jim already said it in the intro. Uh, we are not the kind of company that will send you a bill for a five minute email answer uh, or even that free hour of consulting. So consider us a resource. We're more than happy. Uh, to provide an answer. And if we can't provide the answer, we'll, we probably know somebody who can provide the answer. So uh, that's a benefit we like to pass on. Now, I do recommend you contact uh, either Jim directly or one of my other guys like Ian, because they're just much more able to answer quickly. My inbox is always overflowing. But if you do contact me, I, I promise to uh, answer to you as well. It might just take a little bit longer. Now, while this presentation is going on, you'll see me looking over here. Uh, that's not because I'm losing interest in what I'm doing. That's because over here is my control screen and where my people feed me question, this is, uh, questions. This is a complete live event. So this is not a pre-recorded webinar or anything like that. So as you ask questions uh, in the YouTube channel, uh, it'll pass, be passed on to me if uh, my guys can't answer directly. And I will then pick up on that question probably towards the later part of the presentation, but also while we are moving forward. Um, now, if you're watching this as a recording, again, feel free to send us questions after the event. Now, with that said, let's get started. Uh, we're going to go through a bunch of services. You're going to see a little bit of code, uh, not a huge amount, but a little bit. And, uh, and yeah, should be fun. So here we go. 
To set the stage, I want to talk a little bit about Azure architecture overall. And when we talk about Azure architecture, a lot of times we're talking about cloud native. Cloud native is this term that you'll hear a lot these days. This is not Azure specific. You'll hear this on, on the AWS cloud from Amazon and, and other clouds. And what are we really talking about when we talk about cloud native? Cloud native is essentially an approach to architecting applications and systems. Uh, it's an approach where you architect something with the cloud in mind. Now, people often say, well, what is that concretely? Well, it's very difficult to put into concrete terms, but what it basically means is you're sitting down and you're assuming from the get-go that your new system will be built on top of the cloud. And that changes the architecture from thinking about servers, from thinking about your data center, from thinking about running on a specific machine, like running SQL Server on a box and running your middle tier on a box and so on, to truly thinking about architecting with the cloud in mind, running databases, for instance, that can scale seamlessly, running systems that can scale up and down as needed, uh, talking about things like microservices that'll just run on a provided platform rather than specific boxes or virtual machines. Uh, it's also about using services that would not be available or would be difficult to do on your local environments or your in-house data centers. Uh, an example would be, where do I store binary files my application may need? In the past, we often stuck that in the database. Today, we have completely different options to do so that are just cloud services where I don't have to really worry about what's the path to that file, how much can I store, how big, how do I back that up? Um, and of course, it's also talking about other larger scale services. Um, Cognitive services come to mind, maybe computer vision. Um, so a lot of stuff like that, where you're just fundamentally thinking about things a little bit different. You'll probably think more about how do I orchestrate containers, for instance, uh, that may make up my microservice backend rather than just, oh, here is my machine that I deploy an ASP.NET API layer to. So that's awesome. If you have a new system, and you can think out of the box, you can think about this new way of doing stuff. Uh, you can embrace all these new services. That is great. And that's what we are talking about when we say cloud native. It's really more an approach. It's a mindset rather than uh, just a specific, you know, one, two, three, here are the steps that you want to take. Now, if you're sitting in this presentation and go, oh my God, I'm already not in the right talk because I don't have a new system I need to architect. Well, fear not, because a big part of our presentation today is what I titled conventional apps here. Uh, conventional apps to me means you have an existing app uh, or you have an app where you're just not quite ready, ready to take that cloud native dive, but you still want to take advantage of a lot of the cloud offerings. And, and truth be told, if I look at what our, cons what our customers are doing that we consult with or build software for, this is probably the bigger bigger pool of applications and systems. It's nice if you have a new application where you can go out and really start from scratch and do all these awesome things or at least transition into cloud native. But the reality is you're probably not starting from scratch in a majority of cases and you have existing code or, or maybe you're just not ready to take that plunge and you want to take a little more gradual and you have what I call conventional apps that you now want to start taking advantage of uh, some of those new uh, services and things that are available. So that's perfectly fine. Don't think, uh, oh, I'm not in the cool crowd that does all this new stuff. Why are we not doing this? You're probably in the majority of uh, crowd uh, at this point. And there's certainly a lot of benefit you can get out of doing your application in your system with just some cloud services being part of your application architecture. Um, now, one of the things uh, that I want to take a little bit of a side note on, and that is cloud security and privacy. Uh, this is not a talk about cloud security and privacy. Uh, nevertheless, it's super important. Uh, the trend towards more secure apps is very, very important. Uh, we have in the past done presentations about hacking or being hacked. Some of you may know that about a year and almost two years ago now, we had a major 
uh, ransomware attack that was executed on us and the magazine and, and our services in general. And if you've seen that presentation I've done, we were able to fight that off pretty well, but it was still a big effort and took us a while to do so. And, you know, how did we do that? And, and how were we able to fight that off and recover from it is a very interesting topic. Uh, and I recommend you go back, look at the presentation of that. But the point is, if you go with the cloud, especially cloud native, you may have less of a, of a threat surface, an attack surface that you offer to people that try to attack your systems. And, and just to give you an idea there, we get attacked almost every day. We just manage to fight it off uh, or have been able to do that so far. And a big part of that is simply because the cloud offerings, especially uh, the Microsoft cloud, I feel is very, very good at fighting that off. And also AWS clouds and other put a huge amount of effort into fighting off threats and attacks. But, and this is why I'm putting this presentation slide up here today, this doesn't come for free. It doesn't mean just because you're on the cloud, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You need to very much worry about it. You need to very much worry about having your things uh, configured correctly, not offering up uh, you know, open ports in your virtual machines and so on and so forth. So that's an important aspect. Now, I feel in a way that should be a big part of, a, of an architecture presentation, but I have limited time. I need to pick and choose. But cloud and security um, is something that, you know, you need to always consider and make part of your overall effort. You can't just say, oh, I have all my people develop this app and, and somebody architect the system and then we'll bolt on the security on the side. You have to think of security from the get go. And as a side note, uh, we have actually partnered with a company that does security reviews, that does security training after we've used their services a lot ourselves because I feel that is very important. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend it. Uh, have some very good guys there that can do that for you, and uh, love to hook you up with them. Really good stuff going on there. Um, so I have some questions online. Uh, I'm gonna answer some of them later. Uh, the, the presentation that I gave, uh, I believe, was just entitled "The Anatomy of a Ransomware Attack." Uh, so contact me. I can probably provide you a link to that. Um, so anyway, that's a side note, so just so you know, I don't have much time to talk about this today. We'll have separate talks about that in, in the future, but that does certainly not mean that I feel that this is, uh, is not important. I, I feel that this is super important. But anyway, let's dive into the various services that Azure offers us to create and architect our applications. Um, so we've done this before. Uh, you can go back in our Stata.net archive. You can find uh, two or three different Azure talks. And one of the things that I and others often like to go through is this approach where we say, here's a bunch of Azure services every, every developer should know. You'll often see this as five or seven services you should know. Uh, in my talk, it's usually a few more than that. Uh, and so we're going to kind of reiterate over that just from a slightly different angle. Um, and the first thing that I want to start out with here is Azure App Services, because in a way that's the most fundamental thing most developers do on any cloud and, and of course also on Azure. So what's an app service? If you've never done any cloud stuff, uh, I'll just review that really quick. Uh, for those of you who've done this uh, ad nauseum, don't, you know, don't tune out right now. Um, an app service is simply a way to run a simple web app, whether that is a website, whether that is a kind of more of a mobile app, whether that's an API, very often it is API these days or microservices or, or whatever you want to call that. But it's basically, if you think of, I want to run a website on Azure, that's what we are talking about. Uh, and so it's a very, very simple offering, very, very simple service that Microsoft provides, but it's also for us probably one of the most useful services and almost every application today uses this as a cornerstone. Now, some people say, well, I'm building my websites with a client side only. I don't need uh, an app service that runs anything server side. That may be true, but then you at least need the uh, services and uh, you know, middle tier getting to the data, running some logic. And that is something you'll probably run as an app service. So almost always there. You have some alternatives to that as we'll see. 
Uh, but just because this is such a simple service doesn't mean you shouldn't embrace it. This, this to me is an architectural cornerstone in today's applications. Now, what does Microsoft do there? Again, for those of you who haven't really looked into that or haven't run on, uh, on the cloud yet, uh, it's simply think of it as a, as a, hey, here's my computer in the cloud that can run my stuff. Now, it's not necessarily a machine. It's not even a virtual machine. It's just a system that can run your stuff. And Microsoft takes care of it. You don't have to ever patch your operating system. It has high availability. It can scale. You don't ever have to worry about losing your data and so on. Uh, so it's a great service in that sense. It's much preferable over running a virtual machine in the cloud. Uh, that's a question I get quite a bit. People say, hey, well, I have this system and we've run it in our in-house data center and we've run it as a virtual machine. And, and that's our web app, right? That's our ASP.NET based web application and that's our service layer. I have this in a VM or multiple VMs. Can't I just deploy that to the cloud? And the answer is probably yes. You can go and run a virtual machine on the Azure cloud as, as you know, on, on many of the other clouds and you can deploy your VM image into that. The downside of that is you're now in charge of a lot more yourself. You have to worry about a lot of stuff yourself. You have to worry about patching. You have to worry uh, about where does this run? What, what real machines they have available that run this stuff? Uh, and it's more expensive uh, because now you have this big VM, probably gigabytes in size, running on Microsoft's infrastructure and they're gonna charge you for that. So it's more expensive. It doesn't scale as well. Um, it's more work on your end. You're in charge of a lot more. You have to have more expertise to run that stuff. Uh, or you can just use an Azure App Service, take your ASP.NET app or any other web app. It doesn't have to be ASP.NET. That's one of the things that a lot of people are always surprised about. They assume, uh, if they've never seen Azure before, they assume that, hey, it's a Microsoft service. Surely I have to run .NET and surely I have to run on Windows. And that's not the case. You actually have a large degree of freedom as to what you can run. Um, and, and Microsoft's philosophy is let's run everything, every development stack, every operating system, not just Windows. Uh, and so this is a great offering, very simple, but, but, but also, like I said, a cornerstone of just about every development effort these days. Uh, if you're a Visual Studio developer, and chances are, if you are in this talk, uh, that you do come from a Microsoft background, Visual Studio has great integration for deploying and, and interacting with Azure App Services. Okay. So that's cool. It makes everything uh, very simple. Now, some architectural thoughts around App Services. Um, it's perfectly fine to use Azure App Services, like I say, as is. Uh, you're creating an app service and I'll just I'll open a browser here in just a second to show you how to do that. You create an app service, you configure a few things and boom, there you are, your, your application is ready to go. And you can just go into Visual Studio and you can deploy straight out of Visual Studio. Now, of course you can do much more advanced things and in many scenarios, you probably want to do that. Um, for instance, you probably don't want to just right click publish out of Visual Studio but if you're building anything larger uh, with multiple people involved in a team with a process that has staging and production environments, uh, you probably want a little more of a DevOps setup where you have a, a structured way of going through this whole process, maybe continuous integration, maybe automatic deployment. All of that is fully supported, of course, on Azure. Now, when you listen to people, it sounds a whole lot like everybody needs to do that. But in my experience, that's not true. I think that's one of those things where you really want to weigh what it is that you actually need doing. Like for instance, we are running some small things in-house, applications that are very useful uh, to probably a, a, just a small number of people, but nevertheless. And frankly, it's just not worth uh, having this whole big continuous integration process, this whole team-based process, this automatic deployment process, because you have to be aware that if you do all that, that's stuff that needs doing, right? That's what it means to do that. Uh, and if it's just a small system, as we often build today, then adding that overhead can be more than half the work. 
and it's stuff that needs to be maintained. It's stuff that needs to actually work. It's, it's a little bit of a black box and often you sit there wondering, oh, I just deployed a new uh, code base into my production branch on GitHub. Why is it not showing up uh, in my web system? And I have to debug through that and you know, right click publish in, in Visual Studio often works just as well. Now people that are DevOps aficionados are going to, oh my God, what is he talking about? And for many scenarios, that's true. I wouldn't do it like that. Uh, if you're a large enterprise, if you have a small team of people working on stuff, if you know it's mission critical uh, that you, and you really can't break it, or maybe you're even uh, public facing and you have an app uh, that serves a large customer base, you certainly wouldn't want to do that. But if it's this little thing, frankly, we do that at times and, and it works very well. And that's one of those examples where I say, what's the problem we are actually solving? Do we have a system where we need to make sure, you know, it's a system that if it's down for a day or two or three is no big deal. We just need it a few days a month. Well, I don't need to architect and, and implement that the same way as a system that's absolutely mission critical, serves thousands or, or millions of customers and, and just can't fail. Uh, so know your scenario and don't feel ashamed just because you're taking a little bit of a simpler route at times, but be aware when that needs to be done. And if you have any specific questions about that, I'm more than happy uh, to look at your situation. And I have some, several people uh, that can look at that situation and, and, and advise you on how to do that. Now, what I do find very interesting with all the customers that I advise, uh, and uh, some of them are very large enterprises, some of them are smaller companies, some of them are startups, some of them are public facing, some of them are internal facing. One of the things that I have discovered over the last few years, for the last eight to 10 years, I would say, and this surprised me myself, is that a lot of the companies that have the simpler processes are actually much more successful in deploying uh, their systems and running and operating their systems. And I think that has to do with the fact that the scenarios changed. We went from building these huge systems that took years to build in very large teams to building systems that still fundamentally have all the same features and the same pieces, but built out of much, much smaller pieces, whether that is microservices, whether that is small apps and applets, small websites, rather than one humongous system. And with that, a lot of the problems we had in the past, whether that's on the project management side or whether that's on the actual continuous integration and deployment and, and logistical side, a lot of those problems just have, have either disappeared or gotten much smaller. And then it doesn't make sense to deploy the same size of infrastructure as you would deploy in those larger scenarios. Okay, now I see there's questions online. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to get to that a little bit later uh, when it fits in a little bit better, but I'll definitely answer all your questions. So let's just go ahead and let's go and actually log into our Azure setup here. And uh, I have some stuff set up here that allows me to do some demos. I also have some stuff here that's actual production stuff. Uh, but what I want to do here, first of all, is I want to create a new app service just so those of you who haven't seen that uh, ever know what we are talking about here. So I'm going to go into Azure. I'm going to go into my app services, click create. You could also do that in a slightly different way. Uh, just by going saying add a new resource from right here, or you could do that up here in the corner uh, and you can actually search for app services as well. Um, but most of the time you'll already have some and, and you can just go into your list of app services and click create here. So when you create a new app service, uh, you set up a few things like you need an Azure subscription, of course, uh, you can bundle things together in a resource group, which is just a management way of going. I have a demos resource group, so I can easily go in, see what, what are all the things I did for demos and remove them. Uh, we then need to provide a unique name. So we'll call this data.net app example. Hopefully that won't be taken. Okay. And then I can decide what exactly do I want to deploy. And we'll talk about some of that in more detail. But the basic idea here is if you're just building an ASP.NET web app, uh, you probably want to deploy your code. 
Right? In other words, you're building an ASP.NET web app in Visual Studio. We could just go through and just create a, the, the simplest of web apps based on the templates that are provided in Visual Studio, and then right click and publish that code into the website. It gets uploaded into the website. It gets uh, compiled on the fly and then uh, run on the website. And then we can come in here and we can say, okay, well, what's the stack we are on? And in our case, I'm gonna use .NET 5. You could already use .NET 6, which of course is gonna release in November. And we'll talk about that uh, in our next state of .NET. Uh, but .NET 5 is the current uh, production version that most people use. Now notice that, like I said, you could use many, many other technology platforms. You can build Java-based stuff. You can do Node.js, PHP, Python, and, and Ruby, and different versions of that and so on. Now the next choice you're gonna make is, are you running on Linux or you're running on Windows? And again, if you're in this presentation, you're probably coming from a Microsoft background and your default choice is often Windows. And, and that's certainly what we did in the past. Um, uh, and then you can go ahead and you can decide where is this gonna run in the world? Uh, you know, we are headquartered in Houston, so we usually run in the central US region. Um, and then you pick what is the service plan you wanna run. And that's actually a pretty significant choice you made. Now, the good news is, you can change that at any point in time. You can scale up, you can scale down. So this is not a make or break choice, but in the big picture, of course, this is a pretty significant choice. So we can go in here and we can change the size of our application. We can say, are we running in dev or test? And uh, we can look at the different pricing tiers that we have. And uh, it's probably gonna be a little bit difficult to see in the in the stream, but it says here loading. That means it's loading an estimate for what this is gonna cost you. So there's some very simple setup that's always free. There's a, a little more of a sophisticated setup uh, that costs uh, less than 10 bucks a month. Uh, it's, uh, basically think of it like a VM that has a gig of memory. And so you can scale that up a little bit. That's good for dev, um, but for production, you probably want a little bit of a bigger system. And so very often, you know, we'll go to something like maybe seven gigs of memory or three and a half gigs of memory. And, and then you can see what this is going to cost you right here for instance 14 gigs of memory is going to run me about 580 bucks a month if i'm okay with seven gigs of memory uh runs about 290 now that's an estimate uh, but it's usually a pretty close estimate a lot of things can get away with this three and a half gig of memory uh costs less than 150 bucks a month and you know down here you always see what that's actually, or, or in here in the description, what that's going to give you. And there's even more options you can look at and so on. So that's running Windows. And again, that's what we just, based on the gut feel as Microsoft developers did a lot in the past. Uh, and that has much the same performance characteristics that you could expect from running in your development environment on a Windows box or running on a virtual machine. Now, what's really interesting is, what happens when you consider Linux as an alternative? Okay, when you run Linux, most of your .NET code will just work. .NET Core, .NET 3.1, .NET 5 is architected and engineered to run on Linux. Most people just based on a gut feel, if you're coming from a Microsoft background, don't do that. But I would urge you to actually give that some consideration. Now let's actually go into some of the pricing tiers here and let's look at what that will do for you. So if you look at a production environment, you see you still have many of these same choices, a certain size uh, of quote unquote VM that you're gonna get some resources essentially that you can get to run your application. And as you see, as these price estimates come up, you'll see very, very different pricing, right? The 3.5 gigabyte costs you only about 80 bucks a month. So that's considerably cheaper than running an app service on a Windows platform. Now, not just that, but in Linux, you also have a little less overhead. It's just fine tuned for these type of uh, server side operations. So what we find is a lot of times when we run Linux based uh, app services, we can actually get away with a lot less resources. So long story short, our experience is that we save considerable resources and expenses when we run Linux and it works just as well. For instance, 
the infrastructure we run behind Code Magazine, which is itself a fairly large setup, we run that, the microservices, <coughs> excuse me, we run that as app services that are running just like this as naked app services uh, in Azure, but we've moved from a Windows to a Linux environment. And that move was very simple. We could, we have a, a large list of services that we run, but we could move that over you know, we did it over the course of a day or two, kind of gradually moving the staging environments and the real environments over. Um, and we saved about 75%. In other words, the new expenses for running these app services between the Linux instances being cheaper and the Linux instances being smaller, um, we are only spending about a quarter as much money as we used to spend in the past. So that's very, very considerable. And I would urge you to take a look at that. Now, what were some of the issues we ran into when we moved from Windows to Linux? They were actually very small. We had a very interesting code base we did that with because Code Magazine has been around since the year 1999. And our very first infrastructure for Code Magazine, we built on an alpha version of visualstudio.net uh, before it was actually available to most people. And a lot of that infrastructure that we started building back then, we were able to bring forward. So a lot of the CRUD operations, the data access, some of the business logic is still 20, it's 20 years old, but it's not an old nasty code base. VisualStudio.net has allowed us to move that forward and, and, and have very little problem. Now we have moved, we've moved it into much more modern environments. We've been able to move that into .NET Core and .NET 5 is what we're currently running on. We moved it from uh, SOAP-based XML services to now uh, a REST-based API, and we've been able to move that code base forward. Um, and finally, we moved it into Linux. So there was some old stuff in there, and we had surprisingly few problems. We had one service we ran that used a third-party component that didn't work in Linux, so we had to keep that on Windows. It's a tiny piece. Uh, we did some GDI plus stuff, so that had to stay on Windows. Uh, and we had some carriage return line feed problems as everybody does when going to, to Linux, especially with an old code base. But those were very, very few and far between. So it was a really easy change to make for us. And it now saves us 75% of the expense we had in running that. So consider that a possibility. Uh, I know it feels a little odd at first as a Microsoft developer to go with Linux, but that's the platform to run your code on, right? Um, Interesting question online. Can you switch from Windows to Linux? Um, in other words, if I created an app service and I created that app service as Windows, can I just switch that over to Linux? And the answer to that is no. You actually have to create a new app service and redeploy to it. Now you can rename services and so on. So what we were able to do is we had our Windows services up and running. We then created a Linux-based service, switched the name over eventually, and then deleted the Windows service. Um, so it's it's not an automatic thing to do, but it's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Okay, and again, we have some other questions. I'm gonna get to a lot of those a little bit later. So anyway, that's a big uh, big part of most applications is is this app services thing. And again, consider using Linux much much more straightforward. Um, than most people think. Now, there's one final thing I want to show you here, actually, and that is you can now choose to not deploy code, but to deploy Docker containers. Okay? Containerization is a very important aspect, and you can do that for both Linux and for Windows. What's a container? If you've never dealt with containers, containers are basically app virtualization. It's almost like a virtual machine except it's a virtual machine that doesn't include all the operating system and, and all that stuff, which usually amounts to gigabytes of stuff. And it amounts to you maintaining that uh, OS image and having a license for it and all that type of stuff. A container is just a smaller package that runs very much in the same way in a virtualized setup, but it's just your app and its dependencies. So you can actually build an ASP.NET app as you step through this process in Visual Studio, uh, as you create an ASP.NET app picking the ASP.NET template, there's actually a checkbox that says create a Docker container as the output rather than just the code. Um, and so you can do that and you can then deploy this Docker container right into an app service. That's a cool thing to do because it gives you a few benefits. 
it encapsulates the app to make sure if it runs in your machine, it runs somewhere else too. Now, again, that's one of those cases where we're kind of solving problems that we may not necessarily have. ASP.NET in itself actually does a really good job at fixing a lot of the problems we had with that in the past, uh, where different apps running on the same system would interfere with each other because they're running different versions of ASP.NET and, and all that type of stuff. That's solved. Uh, so in a way, what the Docker container does for you is not necessarily what you need, um, but it also has other benefits, right? It allows you to bundle in dependencies. It allows you to do the deployment in a nicer fashion. If you're building something that is not just running in your own website, but you actually want to give this to a customer to run on their website, it's much easier to give them a Docker container. It's also much easier often to do lift and shift from your own environment into the the cloud if you already have Docker containers. And we'll talk about advanced Docker and containerization concepts here a little later today. Um, this is a good first step towards that, okay? So consider this. Honestly, we don't do this that much, but it's kind of a cool thing to be able to do in certain scenarios. Now, does everybody need a Docker container? No. Uh, it, often sounds like that when you uh, attend online events or go to conferences or read in the magazine, like all the cool kids are doing Docker, I should do Docker too. You should know what Docker is, but it doesn't mean you have to do it for every scenario. ASP.NET in itself is doing a good job at isolating and running your piece of code without interfering with other things that may run on the same virtual machine. And that's what ASP.NET Core was originally engineered for that whole reboot of .NET was much about this. Um, but you have the Docker container scenario. And again, that's good if you want to do lift and shift. It's good if you uh, plan to take this further later on and so on and so forth. So that's that's kind of a cool thing to have. Um, question online is, can you deploy a Vue.js app to an Azure app service? Yes, absolutely. A Vue.js app can be done in a number of different ways. It can just be a static thing. You can then deploy it to an Azure app service. You can actually deploy it to something else as well, which is my next slide here, which is static web apps. Often web apps don't actually need server-side processing. When you do something like Vue or Angular or REST, you often have just a single page app that's just static HTML pages they just need to be served up. There's no server-side processing. You could do that with an app service, but it's probably the better choice to use this new thing called static web apps, which are actually optimized towards that and are optimized towards running as cheaply as possible, causing you as, as few expenses as possible because you don't need to run the whole server-side processing infrastructure if all you're doing is serving up files. So if uh, your view app is like that in nature, then that's probably all you need. View apps often also have server-side components. They're often mixed in with server-side components. You can do view within ASP.NET. Um, then you can deploy into an app service. So, so both of those are available. But this is also an interesting topic. Static web apps allow you to do interesting things. You write your HTML pages and CSS and all the stuff that goes with it. Uh, and you then maybe push it into Git or Azure DevOps, uh, or more often than not, people use GitHub these days. And then you can actually do a continuous integration thing where the content gets deployed into a static web app on Azure and it serves it up very efficiently and costs you very, very little money. Now, you will probably need some kind of server-side processing, some logic. Uh, I've seen very few apps that don't need that. Maybe yours is a special case, but in most cases you need some logic that runs on the server to access data and that type of stuff. So you probably still have this API layer that we have, whoops, right here, I guess. Um, and that can still run either as, a, as an app service or as Azure functions, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, some questions online uh, around how do you expose an on-prem database to an Azure web app? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, do you want to do server-side processing of the data within the web app? Could you just open a connection to your SQL server? That is certainly possible to tunnel to your on-premise web app. And that, I feel, is one of the great advantages of the Azure Cloud is this hybrid approach where uh, Microsoft very much caters to this need of not always uh, having everything on the cloud, right? This hybrid approach. I think Microsoft is better at that than any other 
uh, cloud out there. Uh, you could also potentially have services running on your in-house system uh, that are just REST-based services that might be a, a little more secure as there's another layer removed, a little less attack surface. So that's something that we also see done quite a bit. We also see scenarios where people replicate the data into the, into the cloud or at least some of the data. Okay. So anyway, consider that the static web stuff as well. Um, now, moving along, let's talk a little bit about Azure Functions. And you have similar concepts in other clouds, like uh, the Amazon AWS cloud has the, the lambdas that we talked about in stata.nets before. Uh, so what is this all about? Uh, when you talk about functions, you'll very often hear the concept of serverless computing. Uh, and people go like, well, we're running the cloud and there's no servers. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that there's no servers. It just means that you don't worry about the servers. In other words, you're not saying here is my resource that has seven gigabytes of space available and that's probably implemented as a VM uh, is what, what it's really doing, but we don't care, right? But still we care that there's this, this resource space available. And that's kind of the equivalent of a, of a machine with seven gigabytes of memory. Um, if you're talking about serverless, you're just talking about here's my code, run it. I don't care how many servers you need. I don't care how much memory that needs. I, I don't care how much compute power that means. I just want it to scale up and out and I want it to uh, collapse the scale back down when I don't need it. I only want to pay for what I need. And that's exactly what we mean by serverless computing. Um, and we can do that with Azure Functions. And Azure Functions can do a whole lot of stuff. Azure Functions are simply a piece of code that could be very trivial, like just a small function, or it could be very complex. Often it's in the same nature as a microservice. In fact, you could think of running an, an ASP.NET API type of microservice app as functions. The functions could probably do much the same things. Uh, they could just respond to HTTP requests just like any other re uh, REST API does. But functions can also do other stuff. They can run on a timer, they can, can deal with queues, they basically respond to some sort of event that happens, right? The, the event could be some message comes in through some messaging infrastructure. The event could be it's on a schedule or the event could be, hey, somebody made an HTTP request, okay? So lots and lots of different stuff, very, very flexible and, and easy to use. Uh, if we go back into our system here, let's create a new resource and let's uh, look for function. And here's our function app. Let's create a new one. And stick it in a demos resource. And we'll just call this data.net functions. Um, and again, I could do different things. I could deploy code. I could deploy a Docker container. Very, very similar to building an ASP.NET app. And in fact, if you're doing this through Visual Studio, your experience is going to be very similar to building any other ASP.NET app. Okay. Uh, but just to show some of the differences, pick Node.js here. Uh, and let's continue ahead here. Yeah, that's all fine. Again, we can choose Linux or, or something else. Um, we don't need App Insights. So this would be some statistical tracking and logging. Um, and so we'll just uh, go ahead and create this. And this is going to take a little moment because it's going to stand up this whole infrastructure for this application. So it'll say, Deployment is in progress and, and pretty soon we'll see this app being created. Uh, question online is, uh, do containers allow you to build actual web app hosts? So I'm assuming what that means is I don't want to build an API, but I want to actually build a website, right? Microsoft.com or Amazon.com or something like that. And yeah, the answer is absolutely. Now, if you're building uh, an ASP.web app uh, by picking the container template or by picking a template and ticking the box for the container. It's not a separate template. It's the same template, but you say, make the output a container. It just does one more step during compilation. Then that can be anything that responds to HTTP requests, including a massive website. In fact, if you're building a massive website, going a container route is probably great because you can then scale that more efficiently as your web app does indeed become the new Amazon. Okay. Um, question about data, we'll get to that in a moment. But anyway, 
So back to a functional app. So uh, the resource got created. Let's go there. So it tells us a little bit about how is this app available? These functions has an external facing uh, URL. And we can actually look at the list of functions. Now we don't have any functions yet. Now we go into Visual Studio or, or a Node.js development environment in this case, but we can also just create a function right here in place. Okay. Um, and we'll just uh, create an, uh, a function that responds to HTTP. Now you can see that there's different things you can use just out of the box to trigger functions. But in our case, we'll just uh, make an HTTP request. And uh, for simplicity's sake, uh, we, we call it hello. And we say, let's go ahead and create that. Um, and that's similar to deploying out of Visual Studio. Um, and in fact, if you would have picked .NET as a template, we could have done the same thing here, written some C-sharp code right within that function, um, and then download it and say, oh, now I want to continue in Visual Studio, and now the project grows, and you're actually creating a Visual Studio project with many functions. Okay? It's organized a little different, say, from a, an API project, but it's, you know, the code you write is, is very, very similar. And so uh, we can actually go into this code and test environment here. And because I chose Node.js, it actually starts with an index file. And this is just, let me zoom in on that a little bit because now you need to read the code. This is just relatively simple JavaScript code, right? And it basically says, okay, when the function executes, here's the, the code that executes and we're doing a bunch of stuff like logging if you want. Just has some sample code in here, right? And and this expects a name to be passed in. We would change that, right? Just the sample, sample template. And then it just echoes back that name and it creates a, a response that has a body with that message. So in this case, it's about as simple as it can be, just return some text. We could make it return HTML, then it have a website. Well, we could return REST and JSON or, or just JSON, I should say. Now we'd have an API and that's what a lot of these functions are doing. But in this case, it's, it's very simple. And so we can go ahead and we can run this and we could say, how do we want to run this? Uh, we could get that method and see here, it's passing in a, an example body. That would be for a post operation. We'll do a get and we'll just say, let's add that name parameter here uh, and call that Marcus. And we'll go ahead and run this. And down here, it will show us the result of that particular function. Um, the, the console, and then here's the result of that function. So it says, hello, Marcus, hey. Uh, and we could change that, right? And we could say, hello world, Marcus, and run that. And you'll see that that output changes, okay? So we wrote our first function. Uh, well, it didn't, I guess I didn't save it. There we go. So we wrote our first function, pretty straightforward. Um, and we could now take that into real development environments. Just because I'm doing this in Azure, don't take that as, oh my God, I have to do my coding in Azure. It's just a simple starting point. You take that, you take the JavaScript or you take the Visual Studio code, you write your code in C Sharp. That's what we do most of the time, but you could use PHP and you get all kinds of stuff. Right, so now we have this function. Now note you can also get a URL to this function here uh, because this is public, right? Let's take that out and let's just paste that into our browser here and let's pass in this parameter, right? And let's run that. And you see, uh, that this actually executed correctly and it gives us the uh, whatever the response in HTTP is back. And if you are actually watching this live uh, rather than a recording and you're gonna put in this exact URL, uh, then you'll see that this works for you publicly. This is now available uh, to everyone. Now, the bad news is that I'm gonna go in and I'm actually gonna delete this. So if you didn't do it right this moment, then uh, this function app has just disappeared again. So, so this is a cool thing to have available. Uh, what's really nice about these functions is 
that you only pay for what you use and you can use this for API. So that is one of the big things that we use this for is an, a replacement for uh, containers or app services that are the middle tier of our app, if you wanna think of it like that. The benefit is it's generally cheaper uh, as you only pay for what you use unless you have an app that's permanently busy. The downside is you have a few things like Microsoft manages this as efficient as possible, including shutting it down. So there's no server um, uh, compute power wasted, no memory allocation wasted. And therefore you pay what we call a startup penalty. In other words, if, if the service is not busy, if the, the fun functions app is not busy, this may actually shut down. And the first time you hit it, uh, the, sh the, the startup may be considerable. I mean, depending on, on the exact scenario, this could be seconds or it could be, you know, a half a minute sometimes for the first, probably not, but you know, you're paying a startup penalty for this. So that's the downside. And that's why you want to weigh your, your benefits um, and your downsides. Now the startup penalty is getting slower. The startup penalty can also be alleviated. You can say, I want to build my functions app where it's basically kept alive. Then you don't pay that startup penalty, but it means the funk, the app is kept alive and you're therefore paying a little more uh, and the service becomes more expensive. So there's a question online. Uh, when do you want to use that versus apps? Well, it's a little bit of a trade-off. Main downside for me is that cold start penalty. Okay, we already talked about that. Um, there's a, a related topic to this, and that's Azure Event Grid. Azure Event Grid takes this idea that things are triggered based on certain events. It takes that to the next level, right? So it can do many, many more inbound events. Like I see, you can have IoT stuff. You can have things happening in blob storage. You, you can have all kinds of stuff happening that triggers things, including Azure Functions, and it can also trigger other things. Okay, so event grid is kind of the next level of this event-based system. Something happens, let's trigger something else. Azure functions are one of that. So I just wanted to mention that in the app. Okay, now with all of this stuff that we've talked about, let's talk about Kubernetes. Microsoft talks a lot about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an absolute awesome service and it's an absolutely awesome service implementation that Microsoft provides us in Azure. And this has become the, the, the standard for managing containers in Azure. So what does this do? Well, if you have a scenario where you have multiple containers, those containers need to work with each other because they're different services that live inside those containers and one service calls another uh, and you need to scale that up and down and sideways because you have a large system, then you have a real problem on your hands. And that problem of orchestrating and deploying and managing all of that is handled by Kubernetes. So this is an incredible service that if you need it, it's absolutely awesome. Now, Microsoft deals mainly with large scale scenarios, or at least that's what they're architecting Azure for most and foremost, uh, uh, which is good, right? Because we want Azure to work up to those massive scenarios. And hence Kubernetes is a really good thing. So if you have a, a very large system, lots of containers, and or lots of users, lots of scaling need, lots of uh, compute and, and processing needed, then this is what you want to use. If you have a smaller system, and smaller systems can be quite sizable, right? I'm, I'm looking at, for instance, our Code Magazine setup. We get a lot of hits on the Code Magazine website. It takes quite a bit of load it still doesn't take enough load where we say, oh my God, we can't scale to that without a Kubernetes cluster, okay? So that's one of the things I want to point out here today that if you are kind of like, oh, what's this Kubernetes thing? I should probably look into that because everybody does it, but you're not feeling the point, the pain where you're like, well, what I'm doing in app services, you know, I can scale it, but I really need to scale to more. Uh, if you're not feeling that pain, then you probably don't need a Kubernetes cluster. Um, I would recommend that you look into it. I would recommend that you learn about it because it's a cool thing to have. But the reality is most of the customers, the clients we have, 
do not an advanced, need an advanced Kubernetes cluster. And we have some pretty sizable clients. Now, some of them need it, yes. Um, but if you don't need it and you have a Kubernetes cluster, that all needs managing. That all needs infrastructure to run on. It's very easy to take a bunch of services and deploy them into a single resource um, that is a shared resource. Most of the services we run for Code Magazine actually run behind the scenes on what equates to a single VM. It's not a VM, but, but if it was a VM, it's a single resource because .NET services, uh, especially running on Linux, are pretty efficient and, and they're pretty small. They don't allocate oodles of memory. They don't, for the most part, run really long. They're microservices. Right? And, and we can scale just with app services well enough uh, to work perfectly fine. But if you wanted to go to this next service, then you could set up a Kubernetes cluster and use Azure Kubernetes services to manage that. And now you have multiple resources that you manage. Uh, you have storage accounts. You have the whole Kubernetes overhead. So it becomes a separate task. You probably have a guy that does this. Okay. Uh, and if you don't feel you're that big, don't feel like, oh, you're not uh, in the modern crowd that does all the cool stuff. It's perfectly fine to not use that. But if you do need it, this is a really, really good service to have available to yourself. Okay. And I think I just said that. So let's move along. Uh, there's a related topic to this again, and that's Azure Arc. Another truly awesome service that Microsoft provides, and that is basically cross-cloud management of many things, including Kubernetes services, but also other stuff. Uh, so what Azure Arc allows you to do is it allows you to manage all your stuff that you have in Azure, but it also allows you to manage stuff that's outside of Azure, whether that's in your own uh, data center on-premise, whether that is other clouds. Uh, it is very, very common to architect systems that are based on multiple clouds. There's nothing wrong with using some service on AWS that Amazon does really well and another service that runs on Azure and some stuff that sits in your own data center on-premise and, and some stuff that maybe runs in the Google Cloud. Uh, in fact, that's a very common scenario that we see. Why would you limit yourself to only one cloud? You can pick and choose the things that work well. The challenge becomes how do you manage that? And most of the time, the cloud providers, they don't care that you're running on multiple clouds. That's your problem. Well, Microsoft recognizes that problem and provides you Azure Arc to manage all that stuff. And in fact, you could use Azure Arc even if you don't use any Azure services. Um, so cool thing to have, cool thing to be aware of. Okay. Uh, another thing that's nice is if you do a lot of microservices, aka APIs, then you often need to manage it. What are the versions that I have? Who can access them? All that type of stuff. Compliance, what are usage limits? Uh, how much am I actually using? Am I in, in trouble with some of the services that go over usage limit? And then how do I discover these APIs? And Azure offers a separate service for that. I don't know if that's truly considered architecture, but it's certainly interesting enough to, man to, to mention here in this presentation today. Um, again, if you have a small system, you have an app uh, that, and uh, you know something you built in, in ASP.NET as an API layer, you deploy that, you probably don't need API management. You have five of those, you probably don't need API management. You have 50 of those, maybe API management is a cool thing to have. Now, moving along a little bit, uh, let's talk about some of the other things. Uh, Azure Storage. This is a cool thing. What this allows you to do is it basically allows you, well, as the name says, to store stuff, files, uh, typically. But you could also do simple tables, uh, you know, almost like a table in SQL Server, just simple, no, no relationships, but structured data. Uh, you could do queues and so on. But most of the time, we're talking about files. So this gives you a way to store files into the cloud. You could even map a drive to it and, and consider this your cloud drive. Uh, but most of the time, it's used more in architectural, uh, in, in a way where you access it through an API. And the cool thing about that is, first of all, it's cheap. Secondly, it's reliable. It's automatically backed up. You can geo-replicate it. It's very high performance. Okay, So you get lots of that stuff. It's very secure. 
Um, it does a little more than the average file system because you can attach more information, more meta information to it. There's different tiers of this available. So we use that in our architecture extensively. And this is one of those things that you could also use even if you have a totally conventional old fashioned, let's say a WinForms app that runs in your local data center and directly accesses SQL Server, but it needs to store binary files. Well, in the old days, we often stuck that into a file share somewhere. And then the problem was, how do you back that up? And what if your deployment ever changes? So if you want to be a little more advanced, maybe you actually stick your files into SQL Server, but now you have all these binary files in SQL Server and it bloats things and it makes it difficult to back stuff up and, and restore. And if you do this in the cloud, it's just more expensive. And, and so this Azure storage is a really cool thing to have. Okay. And it's easy to use. How do you use this? Well, you could map a drive into Azure and then that would just work. But more often than not, you will actually use the API. So when you're building an ASP, excuse me, any .NET app and even other systems, you can download packages that allow you to access Azure storage. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna show you a quick example for this. And I'm actually gonna give you a glimpse into some of our production code that we have. Um, I'm just gonna open a, a code base here that I have. This is a microservice that we run. It's kind of part of what we do uh, for, uh, it's one of our code magazine microservices. And this has to do with the magazine stuff. It's a relatively small helper function that I'm showing you here. And this is a piece of code that allows me to upload stuff into blob storage in Azure and run it. Now there's also this other tool that we have here called the Azure Storage Explorer. Okay, um, here it is. Now this allows you to look into what you have in Azure as far as blob storage or storage goes. And so I have a few different things here. Uh, I have what's called a container. I think it is like a, you know, a drive. And in that container, I have a few, if you want to think of it like folders, right? So here's one that I use for demo purposes a lot. And in this folder, there's subfolders and there's some files in here, okay? Uh, and these are just image files at this point, but it could be anything. And so I stored that into Azure. How did I do that? Well, I could have used this file explorer and dropped stuff into it. I could have mapped a drive to it and then it would just showed up as another drive. But in most apps, you do it differently. You actually use an API. Uh, so here is that API. And um, in this case, I just have a blob helper. I have some packages that I downloaded. So there's Azure blob storage package you can download from NuGet. And that's what I'm using here. So what do I do to upload a file? Well, you create an instance of the blob service client and you need a connection string. I'm not gonna show you what my connection string is because that's my production connection string, but you can get that from Azure. If you just go into the management portal, you can say, give me my connection string. I have that stored up here somewhere. And this is just the whole connection string that I'm not gonna show you. And that's what's being used to create this client. Um, then I get access to a specific container which would be that Marcus, uh, excuse me, that EPS enterprise container. Uh, and if that container doesn't exist, I can create it on the fly, okay? And then I can get access uh, to a specific file name, okay? I, through this container, I say, give me access to that file. This is about uploading files, this example. So this is how I would load files into Azure. So I just say, if that file already exists, get rid of it, okay? And then I'm just grabbing the bytes of my file and I'm just uploading it into Azure, just like that. Um, and then I get a response back to say, this, did this work? And if so, I say, yup, okay. If the response was, was 201, that uh, indicates to me that this file got created. Now I can do additional things that I can't do in a regular file system. This would be, this is a remote access to a drive and write a file out, if you wanna think of it like that. But I can do additional stuff, like I can attach metadata to this, like categories, okay? So that's kind of cool. And, and I can add metadata at will, not just categories, okay? And that's how the file got up there. Now, when files are in Azure, by default, nobody has access to them other than through this API. But I can actually go to my container here 
and I can set things like public access level. And, and, and in this case, uh, for, for this demo folder, I just make it publicly accessible for read access. And I can then go in here and I can actually uh, look at the properties of this and I can find things like the categories that I have attached to uh, in here somewhere, but I can also get the public URL, right? And so I could actually copy that URL and I could then get to this through my web browser. Where did my web browser go? Here it is, right? So I could go in here and access this file and here it is. And you see, this is very, very performant, right? This comes out of Azure. Um, now, if I wanted to know what this URL is exactly, I can actually use my API and get information about the file. So this is a little helper function here where I say, hey, what's this file inside this container? Uh, I want to get information about this. I'm getting access to that container and, and then get information about that file. And so I can get the URI, URL URI to that file if it's publicly available. Right, and I can use that for a variety of things. So when you go to the code website, for instance, and you download your digital issue of the magazine, what we do behind the scenes is we actually, we go into blob storage, grab that public uh, URL and serve it back and, and just redirect to it basically. And so you get this file at a very high performance level and a very low cost to us. Now, if you are downloading, uh, say a PDF of the magazine or a Moby Pocket file or an EPUB file or something like that. Uh, a lot of people do that. We have thousands and thousands of downloads and we want that to work very fast. Uh, but we also have other files. Like for instance, when we produce a magazine and it's the actual print magazine that goes to the print shop, that's a very, very large file that we keep around for later, right? We may need uh, access to a 10 year old magazine at some point, but we rarely do. Uh, and therefore we can say, you know what, that's not as important a file. If that takes a little longer to access, not as high performance, that's fine. Uh, and we can do that too. That's what this access tier is. And you see that these sample files here, they are hot. And that means give me the maximum performance, but I could actually make that cold. Um, and so I could change that to different things. Cool and archive. And that just means Microsoft is now free to put that on all the hardware, maybe needs to dig it out a little more. So while the access to the hot files is blazing fast, maybe the access to my cold file takes a quarter of a second. We're not talking about really slow. We're just talking about not as high performance. And in fact, I've never seen a cold file to really be significantly slower than a hot file, um, but it's cheaper. Okay, so if you have a lot of cold files, that's cheaper. Uh, and storage in general is cheap. This is much cheaper than storing into SQL Server and, and all that. Okay, so cool thing to have. Highly recommend using that. It's super easy. Uh, you don't have to worry about backups. You can geo-replicate. You can take that to the next level if you want. And therefore, any system that you use should probably, should probably take advantage of that. All right, talking about other stuff, SQL Server databases. Again, architectural cornerstone of many apps, even in modern clouds. In, in uh, Azure, you have two ways of hosting SQL databases. Uh, it's a little bit confusing. One is called SQL Azure and what, the other one is called SQL Server on Azure. SQL Server on Azure basically means running SQL Server in the virtual machine on the cloud. It's just like your SQL Server in your, your uh, on-premise data center or in, in the box that stands in the corner, right? And you could literally take that SQL server uh, and replicate it up to the cloud. Or if you have it in a VM, you could upload that VM and, and run it in the cloud. Uh, the downside of that is it's more expensive because you are now using up a whole VM. SQL Azure is a version of SQL that is architected from the ground up for Azure. It's cloud native, if you want to think of it like that. So it can scale in more interesting ways. It allows Microsoft to manage it better. It's, it's serverless, probably, if you want to think of it like that. Uh, so that's what you want to use. It's considerably cheaper. Uh, when we had our, our ransomware attack, we decided that was the time to move everything into Azure. Let's lift and shift our server up into, into Azure. We did that basically in a VM. 
but that was more expensive uh, than running SQL Azure. So over the next month or so, we transitioned that into a SQL Azure database. And, and now it's cheaper. Uh, we get more management thing. We don't have to worry about backing it up, for instance. Microsoft does that for us. We can roll back in time and we can roll forward in time and, and all those cool things uh, that SQL Azure does for you. Now, there's some limitations. It's a little bit of a more modern uh, version of SQL Server. So I have some things here. Uh, what are the limitations? There's no things like database diagrams. Uh, you can't do window, Windows authentication because you're not going to be authenticated into that thing the same way as you are in a VM. Uh, some old field types are not available. That's what got us a little bit. So we still use text fields, for instance. So we just had to go through and change those to bar char max. But they were all very, very easy changes to make. So even a fairly sizable system was not that hard to move into SQL Azure. So I, that's what I recommend, right? If you need a SQL database, run in SQL Azure, convert to that. You get a lot of benefits, uh, not the least of which is just a much lower expense of running it just in terms of dollars, but also in terms of your maintenance overhead, right? So SQL Azure is the way to go. Um, side note, SQL Elastic Pool is cool. If you have a system where you uh, have a lot of databases, so not just a lot of tables, but a lot of individual databases, and those databases change widely and how busy they get, you know, maybe you have a database that gets busy the first of the month and then not, and then others have certain peak times and so on. It's interesting to stick those together into an elastic pool where all those databases essentially share a resource. Uh, so you're not, if you have a hundred databases, you're not paying for a hundred SQL servers essentially, but you're just paying for one SQL server and those databases share an elastic pool that can uh, scale up and down and the expenses are calculated for that entire pool. So that's a good thing to know and use as well. Now, if you want to go a completely different route, you could use Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB is a NoSQL database that's from the ground up engineered for the cloud. So it's not like SQL that's been around for a long time and then Microsoft thinks about, oh, well, how can we make that better in the cloud? But this is Microsoft from the ground up saying, okay, we have the cloud. How can we engineer a database for it? What does it need to do? Is it always structured data? No, but it may be. Is it always data stored on a single machine? Most likely not, right? So this uses storage in a serverless fashion. Uh, it can scale limitless. It's completely managed. Uh, it's globally replicated and you don't have to worry about it. There's different ways of accessing this. Um, so if you're using MongoDB, for instance, Cosmos DB can look to you like MongoDB, except it's from the ground up uh, architected and event invented for the cloud. Uh, you can have different APIs, Cassandra. You can use it more like a SQL database. So if you uh, want to store structured data into Cosmos DB, uh, you can do that as well. Now, from an architectural point of view, um, there are many scenarios where uh, Cosmos is a great fit. It's very flexible, uh, both in size as well as the type of data you store. For instance, we are working on a project uh, where we are consolidating a lot of data. Uh, and then this has to do for schools where we have these different schools that are running different systems. We need to consolidate that data. We need to then pass that data on uh, to various institutions and, and organizations. And that data is very weakly structured and then all kinds of stuff comes our way. It's also very large, it's geographically uh, distributed. So we needed a really flexible database that was beyond of the, the static structure that SQL Server provided us. But not every table is like that. We also have more structured tables and. Um, and so we just need great flexibility and Cosmos DB is a great database for that. And it'll allow us to grow limitless and do this worldwide and so on. But not every problem is like that. Uh, if you just want to store customer data, it's very likely to be just rectangular data with rows and columns and, and not much flexibility needed. And then SQL is often just fine. So, so Cosmos DB is great. We use it a lot. Uh, projects of all sizes. To me, the 
the choosing of, of Cosmos DB is probably mostly driven by the flexibility need, I would say. Um, but more of the projects we do have a need for SQL than Cosmos. Okay? So maybe a quarter or a third of what we do is Cosmos DB, if that, and the rest is more conventional data like SQL. And of course you can mix and match, right? Um, as a side note, this is not an architectural thing, but it goes along with the architecture you choose. And uh, that is DevOps. Should you do DevOps, uh, do you need that? And in many scenarios that are larger, the answer is yes. And DevOps allows you to do many things. It allows you to do continued integration. It allows you to do, uh, at the very least, storing of your source code. You'll probably need that always. But when we talk about DevOps, we're usually talking about more. We're talking about a build pipeline. We're talking about uh, deploying into staging and production environments in a, in a structured fashion. And DevOps is great for that. And Microsoft has two offerings for that. One is Azure DevOps and the other is GitHub. And we did a Stata.net just on that. And we focused mainly on GitHub. Why? Because Microsoft bought GitHub. GitHub is where everything is going. Internally at EPS, we use both. And a lot of our projects actually are in Azure DevOps. And that's not going away anytime soon. Microsoft's own dependency on that is too great. There's too many companies out there that use it. So if, if you are in Azure DevOps, don't be nervous because everybody is going to GitHub. No, but if you're doing something new, I would recommend GitHub for that. Um, so check out that recording of the prior data.net we have. A uh, few other things I just want to mention real quick. I've spent a lot of time on these core services because I think most of you will use those. But Azure is huge and I can't possibly talk about every service, but I'm more than happy to answer questions if you have any. Azure Communication Service is one of those things that's really cool. If you need to add uh, team things, right? Video chat or, or communication through uh, text message or all kinds of stuff. Azure Communication Services is your friend. And over the last two years with the pandemic and work from home and distributed, many, many more applications that I see need this where you can actually integrate with things like MS Teams and extend your system to where you can remotely work together on one thing and capture that beyond of doing a screen share. Okay? So that's a whole new class of application that's becoming available. Uh, in one of the prior data.nets, uh, we talked about teams and, and development for teams, which is a whole new uh, development and architectural discipline, if you want. And Teams is becoming part of Windows 11, which is shipping soon. So go back to uh, the, the presentation we did two months ago showing Windows 11. Uh, we talk about that there. So that's just a side mention. Um, another thing that is something that I think is really cool, and, and I think it's much more useful than people think, and that is Microsoft Cognitive Services. AI, basically. AI and machine learning is bundled up in this... Uh, group of services called Microsoft Cognitive Services and things like computer vision, speech, language processing, search are all part of that and many more. Uh, we did a Stato.net on that in the past. If you're thinking, eh, what app needs computer vision? The vast majority of apps can benefit from computer vision, surprisingly. Uh, for instance, we have a, a customer uh, that uh, delivers well, any kind of product really is, a, is an example that goes for that. And so they have a product database and the customers, customers can look into that product database and see these images. Well, it turned out every now and then, because this is a larger organization, uh, that customer had uh, disgruntled employees that uploaded inappropriate images into that database. Well, with computer vision, it became very simple to just have an AI look at those images and highlight the uh, ones that are potentially inappropriate to manage and say, hey, are you sure this is something we want to show to the customer? And it's not always right, but it's mostly right. And it's worth pointing it out to a manager that this image may need to be reviewed. And so, you know, what, what app doesn't have that sort of need or finding interesting images? Or, of course, it can go into, you know, recognizing what's going on in an image with customers. Uh, that are out in the oil field and they have oil wells and we recognize what's going on at an oil well. Is there somebody there that's not supposed to be there? Is something broken there and so on? Super interesting. We did a Stata.net on that. We have articles that you can read for free. Really cool stuff. One of the things I want to highlight here 
is Azure Cognitive Search. Search in an application is something almost every app needs. I need to search customers. I need to search products. Uh, and search is one of those things that even though everybody needs it, it's usually not done very well. If you do a text search for a product, for instance, how do you really do that? Do you do a full text search into SQL? Okay, well, that search is for a term. What if the term is just slightly different or misspelled? What if I have two or three words? Well, then usually what happens is you just return all the matches. But does it return the most likely match first? How would you even do that? A ranked search. Uh, could you do suggestions where while you type it, it shows a drop down of likely things you might be looking. Those are actually really, really difficult things to do with just conventional database technology. Becomes super easy with Azure Cognitive Search. Almost every app can benefit of that. So check that out. We have an example of that in a priorslater.net. Um, so vision we talked about. Um, moving on from that, I, I would love to talk about Azure Cognitive Search uh for a long time and and vision and all you know speech and all those other things we don't have time but, uh, but i encourage you to check that out let's talk about a few other things to wrap this up here azure key vault when you work with azure you almost always deal with secrets whether that is that key i sh didn't show you for our blob storage access uh the key to get into sql server the you know encryption keys and all kinds of stuff those things are supposed to be kept securely. Did I keep that really secure in an example I had? No, I didn't. Uh, who has access to that? In this particular instance, one developer, that's me. Okay, maybe not that bad. Security-wise, still a nightmare. Developers should not have access to those keys because that's your weak point. And now you open to social engineering attacks. Now you open to uh, disgruntled employees. Now you're potentially saving that into a git repository all kinds of horrible scenarios you don't want to do that in the real world you want to put it into azure key vault all kinds of secrets can go into azure key vault that allows you to access those secrets without actually having them it's more like saying i want to use key number one for this thing and then it uses it without you ever seeing it uh, so that's something architecturally speaking that's a very important thing we already talked about security i want to reiterate that right security is super important uh, i didn't talk about it much today we'll probably have a stata.net or a code presents webinar about that in the future uh, it needs to be there all the time you basically want to think of yourself as doing security driven development um, and you want to review your systems again we can help you with that as well feel free to ping me about that uh, it's not something we are super experts in but we do have the people that are, right? So if you have any questions about that, you can kind of see me as the uh, impartial party that can help you out with that a little bit. So just be aware of that. Uh, and the list goes on. I've picked the services that I think are the most important architecturally speaking for this presentation. But Azure has 260 plus services. Uh, and the list is growing and growing and growing. You can't possibly know them all. Uh, it's good to try to stay up with it as much as you can and you know, see an announcement here or there, spend 10 minutes and reading about it so you know what's going on. Um, but the ones I picked out here are the ones that I think everybody should be aware of. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I see there's a lot of questions online. I'm gonna get that to those here in a minute. A few other announcements. Again, please fill out that survey uh, that Jim talked about in the intro. This helps us tremendously in figuring out what people want to do in the future. Like this talk here was based on people saying this is something that they really would like to see because it would help them in their decision making. And so the survey gives us feedback and that helps us out. Uh, so we're trying to help you out with this uh, presentation. You could help us out by filling in that survey and telling us what you think. And this is so important for us to even giving away uh, an Amazon gift certificate to one uh, lucky winner. Um, again, like Tim said, we are, we are hiring on all kinds of fronts. React developers is one thing that we're hiring a lot right now. There's other things as well. Check out our job openings page on uh, codemac.com. 
And again, if you are sitting in this presentation thinking, wow, this is cool, I'm still not sure how this applies to my project. Or I had a completely different question that wasn't addressed here about architecture or about something totally different. Maybe the, the cognitive services stuff caught your eye and you're like, oh, wow, I wonder what I could do with that. Feel free to sign up for a free hour of consulting. There's no strings attached. You don't need to give us your credit card or anything like that. Uh, it's just something we offer. Now, this has been very popular. So put your name in the hat. Uh, we, it's a first come, first serve basis. And there's only so many we can do with them, obviously, uh, as it takes a lot of our resources. Um, so sign up for that sooner rather than later. Um, Co Magazine mobile reading. Uh, when the pandemic started, we were just about ready to push out this new version of the Code Mobile app, uh, and that's been popular. And we said while the pandemic lasts, all our content is free through that app back to the beginning of Code Magazine time. And the pandemic is ongoing, so we are still honoring that particular commitment. So it's not like I'm trying to sell you something here. This is, this is actually free content. Feel free to pass that on to your friends as well. Um, if you haven't taken advantage of it yet, Microsoft is extending to you a free copy of Code Magazine, a free subscription to Code Magazine. If you are a Visual Studio, a VSS subscriber or a Dev Essential subscriber, essentially what used to be called the MSDN subscriptions in the past, uh, you can go to the website and you'll see this free offer for Code Magazine, uh, which you can get, which you can tell your friends about and always helps us to spread the love. Um, now the next event gonna be an interesting event again. We're getting ready uh, to release .NET 6 or Microsoft is, I should say. So we'll have a preview event on October 27th. Uh, so mark your calendars. It's always uh, the first, the, the last Wednesday of the month. Uh, so we'll have that event coming up. And .NET 6 is gonna keep us busy for a little while. Probably the next one after that is also gonna be on .NET 6 because .NET 6 uh, which is available as a preview right now, is going to be a huge release. It's when this vision for one.net, this reunification of .net comes full circle. So exciting. And that's going to be next month. Um, and that is it. Thank you very much for attending. I'm now going to take a look at the questions that are there. Uh, and like I said, other than that, feel free to contact us if you can think of anything after the fact or you're just watching this as a video. Um, so let's take a look at the questions uh, that we have. Uh, is voice chat the thing? Is that supposed to be voice over IP? Well, voice chat through the Azure messaging uh, service is a thing. So you can just add that to your app video chat as well. So it's a pretty straightforward service to add. Um, uh, somebody says, can you suggest a demo on creating a brand new web app on Azure? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. As you go into the Azure portal, like I showed you here, or you can go back to the video recording and earlier just say, create a new app service, um, uh, pick uh, uh, presumably a .NET app if you're a .NET guy, but it could be PHP, JSON, uh, uh, Node.js, I should say, or, or others. You create that service, now it's there. And when you have a service in the portal, uh, it has a public URL. You can configure custom domains. You then can grab what's known as a deployment profile. You download a tiny publish file that you download. And now you go into Visual Studio, create a new ASP.NET app like you always do, or the tool of your choice, right? If you're a PHP or a Ruby guy, you use that stuff. And then uh, out of Visual Studio, for instance, you can just say right-click publish and you point it to the publish profile you download and boom, there's your web app. Uh, and so we have uh recordings of that in the past uh, just look for anything that has to do with azure uh in the stata.net folder stata.net.com and you'll find that okay uh questions can azure api manage it front end azure functions yes it can uh, depends a little bit on what you do uh, you can, can do a lot of things in azure functions that aren't apis but if it's an api yeah you can actually use that The, do Azure database services have tools to allow you to extract out data from our databases? Excellent question. Yes, absolutely. So that lift and shift scenario, how do you transfer your data into the cloud? That's a, a tricky scenario. Like when we had to, when we decided to move all our data, we decided to just uh, basically upload it. Uh, and that took several days because we have a large database. Now, some people have even larger databases uh, and Microsoft offers, you could even 
send them hard drives physically and stuff like that. So Microsoft is really, really good at these hybrid scenarios, at these lift and shift scenarios. Uh, because Microsoft's an enterprise company, right? They understand those those needs. So yes, there's ways to upload that. Um, can you do Azure, um, I'm assuming Active Directory authentication with static web apps? I do not know the answer to that. Uh, I think so, but ping me about it or ping Jim about it will find you the answer to that. Uh, can I talk a little bit about the managing dev and production environments with web apps? Uh, are those set up as completely separate instances or are they linked somehow? We set them up as separate instances, basically. And so you have your staging environment, you have your production environment. They can be very different in characteristic as far as how much horsepower do you put behind it. Uh, and then we just have built pipelines and DevOps usually when we go that route where um, uh, depending on the branch you're in, it actually publishes into those environments. Now, if you don't have DevOps and you just right click publish because it's such a tiny project, you know, you have the configuration, but Azure config, if you're in a web app, there's a good way to configure resources and, and config settings and so on. And that makes it usually pretty easy where you can just say, right, click publish into the staging environment, for instance. But, you know, the better way to go at that point is uh, through DevOps, obviously. So you don't accidentally publish, you know, your dev environment into production. Uh, let's see, scroll up a little bit. So can we get uh, a fair idea of what app service to use in the following scenarios? First, uh, legacy applications using VB and SQL Server. So that's interesting, right? If you have a legacy VB app, you're probably, and, and, and that could probably be VB6 or it could be VB.net, say a WinForms app, uh, I'm assuming. Um, and that talks to SQL Server. You, well, you could put SQL Server into Azure or use SQL Azure and then connect to that. Um, Gonna take a little bit of bandwidth, right? A chatty protocol, but that certainly works, right? And then your actual app probably runs on the client connecting to the database. So, so that works really well. Um, now the second scenario is web application using the ASP website uh, with COM. Uh, well, you could publish that in a variety of ways. You may, by based on experience, probably end up with a virtual machine, just host a VM in Azure that runs that website. But you could certainly, uh, especially if it's ASP.NET, publish into an older app services that's not on .NET Core or .NET 5, but that's on the full framework, the legacy framework. That's supported as well. So you could run that and, and then go to SQL Server. Uh, MVC. No brainer, you can just publish that into app services and run it pretty efficiently. In fact, we have some sites uh, that are fairly public and they were large ASP.NET MVC 4.x 3.5 projects. We brought most of them forward or all of them actually to 4.8, that's pretty easy, but we didn't convert all of them to .NET Core or .NET 5. Uh, because that's often a huge effort. And if you're using some incompatible stuff, like we're using GDI, for instance, and some of them gets a little tricky to bring forward if you're using third-party components. And there's nothing wrong with sticking something like that into an Azure App Services on the 4.x platform. Works perfectly fine. Uh, and of course, accessing SQL Server and all that uh, perfectly works perfectly fine. You can't run it on Linux because that stuff is Windows specific. Uh, so you're stuck with a Windows container, a little more expensive, but again, cheaper than converting the whole app. Uh, so that works perfectly fine. And then if you want to use JavaScript, uh, business layer, data layer, I don't know what these are written in. Uh, so I'm assuming JavaScript on the front end, that's just totally up to you anyway. If it's a, if it's a thing where you literally don't do any server-side processing, do a static web app, just surfs up files, right? No, no big deal. Uh, business layer could be written in .NET, could be written in just about anything and it'll run just fine. 
on uh, Azure as an app service uh, and then data layer and SQL server, you know, talking microservices, we're talking SQL server databases, like we discussed, all works really, really well. Okay. Um, a question is for deploying a bunch of microservices, which one would be relevant app service or Azure service fabric? Well, depending on how many you have, um, you know, we run systems where we have 20, 30, 40 different deployments of microservices, individual packages of microservices, .NET projects and solutions, right? 30, 40, and, and we just run them as app services and that works perfectly fine for us. Now, once it gets bigger, API management is a good thing to have, right? Uh, Dockerization, eventually you might get into Kubernetes scenarios, but we find that, that uh, we don't have a whole lot of trouble managing that type of stuff. So service fabric, not so much anymore. We're going more to Kubernetes route these days when it comes to that. What's the price range of running an API on Azure? Uh, it's kind of an unanswerable question. I mean, you can start with a totally free level uh, and you can go up to, you know, clusters of stuff. But when you run just a small service, something that you, you know, let's say you, you like these 30, 40 services that I talked about, you could probably run easily on a single Windows machine if it was in your own data center and then run the website on top of it. And, and you know, something like that, you're probably talking about a hundred bucks a month or something or less, right? And, and that would be a pretty sizable system already. Uh, but, you know, you individual what mileage will vary greatly. It depends on how busy the system is and how you scale and so on. Uh, question is, does Azure have any pool of free microservices? Yes, absolutely. So the smallest tiers that are often enough for microservices. And, and by the way, microservices often don't need custom domains, right? It's perfectly fine to have blah, 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 dot Azure websites, dot net as your service URL, because nobody's going to see that. And, and all of that uh, you can often do with a free tiered uh, level of Azure. Uh, somebody says, I'd like to hear about architecting Dynamics applications. I'm not sure what that means. Are we literally talking about Microsoft Dynamics? I am personally not a Dynamics guy. Uh, so if that's what the question is, I can probably get you the answer, but I can't answer it right now. Um, uh, that in the cloud that need to sync with other APIs. See, I don't have, but, but I can find out for you. Uh, and then somebody says, I'd love to hear more about what tools others are using to document the Azure software solution. So there's different things out there. Uh, now I'm not impartial about answering that because we have our own solution uh, to that. Uh, it's a document management system, well, a documentation system, not a document management system. The documentation system is specifically engineered to bring together different sources of documentation, whether that is a markdown documents in GitHub or whether that's stuff in DevOps or whether that's APIs or, uh, you know, Swagger slash open API stuff. There's a lot of different things that you can use there. Um, and, you know, there's document management systems out there. Uh, there's GitHub docs, even that are a simple way to go. Um, but check out kavadocs.com if you're interested in our stuff and be happy to tell you more about that as well. Um, and I think that's just about it. Somebody says, can you provide some information? IPA gateway with WAF. I'm not even really sure what that is to tell you the truth. But anyway, we're going to wrap it up here. I think we're way out of time like I usually uh, am in this presentation. So if you have any questions, if I didn't answer some of your questions, send an email to Jim uh, or myself, if you're willing to wait a little longer for an answer. And other than that, thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you next time. Uh, we'll be exciting to talk about .NET 6, finally getting to that level. And other than that, thank you very much for attending. See you next time.